Made. Hundreds arrested, according to State TV, armed protesters tried to overrun military bases and police stations before security forces stopped them last night. Government officials have blocked access to Instagram and Telegram, a messaging app that activists have used to organize some of those protests. Demonstrations started last week over economic issues, some protesters chanting against the government and the Supreme Leader. Connor Powell, live in our Mideast News Hub with more on this. Uh, Connor, are these protests growing? Molly, growing and also popping up all over the country. This was uh, this what we're seeing there is still relatively small in comparison to what we saw back in 2009, where millions of people came out on the streets, particularly in Tehran. But these uh, these protests, these demonstrations, are really interesting because they are all over the country. Now, those were largely in 2009 centered in Tehran. Well, these are coming up in some conservative areas of the country, uh, but the crack down is also starting to intensify there. The Iranian state media reporting hundreds of people have been arrested and at least 12 people have been killed in the last couple of days. And the Iranian government has blocked access to the Internet, cutting off social media sites like Instagram. And given Iran's authoritarian regime, it's also uh, its history of a sort of a repressive regime. It's hard to see these protests continuing uh, without a further crackdown. And Molly, one of the interesting things we're hearing is that the majority, like 70, 80 percent of the people People protesting are under the age of 25 right now. Yeah, so the future generations. You now, this is about far more than just the economic situation there, right? Yeah, this started in uh, with a cries about the economic stagnation across Iran, and these protests that started in conservative smaller areas, not in Tehran, which is urban and much more developed, but they're starting in some of these uh, these smaller conservative areas. But we're also seeing a criticism of the Islamic Republic uh, being voiced as well. We've seen women remove their headscarves, and people are denouncing in some cities the supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, Iran's president Hassan Rouhani, a moderate and a reformer in the Iranian political environment. Well, he said, while violent protests will not be tolerated that he supports the demonstrators right to protest and adding that there are legitimate grievances about the current state of affairs in Iran the corruption the stagnation of the economy and it does appear in many places that security forces are allowing peaceful protesters to protest in other places there have been crackdown on peaceful protesters Rouhani Amali uh, appears to be trying to walk a fine line between uh, voicing uh, the, the the complaints of the average citizen of Iran while at the same time trying to walk a line of not creating too much tension, not inflaming the situation. He's trying to have it sort of both ways, where the government is seen as a protector of the people and not the, uh, the oppressor of the people. How long that can last, though, that's a big question. We're watching the next couple of days to see if this continues the way it is. Does it uh, spark more protests or do they die down as well? Molly? Yeah, no doubt that it is a dangerous place to be a, a political dissident or to push back against the government, as we're seeing right now. Uh, Connor Powell, thank you. Well, President Trump is set to head back to Washington in about an hour. He tweeted earlier, we'll be leaving Florida for Washington, D.C. today at 4 p.m. Much work to be done, but it will be a great new year. The president also taking swipes at Iran and the Obama administration. Steve Harrigan has been live in West Palm Beach, Florida, following the president. Not so far from the president's resort, of course. Steve? Molly, as he has throughout this 10-day working vacation in Florida, the president was up early and added on Twitter today, taking aim at the protests in Iran, writing the following. Iran is failing at every level despite the terrible deal made with them by the Obama administration. The great Iranian people have been repressed for many years. They are hungry for food and for freedom. Along with human rights, the wealth of Iran is being looted. Time for a change. This is the fourth day in a row the president has tweeted about Iran, bringing a lot of attention to those demonstrations and once again showing his support for the protesters. Molly? All right, the president heading back to Washington. What is on the agenda when he returns? The president really laying out a very optimistic mood for 2018 at Mar-a-Lago last night where he was ringing in the new year as he has for the past decade with family and friends. The president predicting that 2018 will be a banner year. We're going to have a great year. It's going to be a fantastic 2018. We're off to a very good start, as you know, with the great tax cuts and ANWR and getting rid of the individual mandate, which was very, very unpopular, as you know. But we are going to have a tremendous year. The stock market, I think, is going to continue to go up. 
Among the events coming up for the president, a Camp David meeting next weekend with Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan. The trio are likely to lay out a legislative strategy for the coming year. Molly, back to you. All right, the holidays are over. Thank you so much, Steve. We appreciate it. And back to work, so let's bring in our political panel. Vincent Blasio, Republican strategist, former campaign manager for George Pataki's presidential run, and David Morey, a Democratic strategist, co-author of the Leadership Campaign. Uh, Vincent, I want to start with you and what's happening in Iran. I noticed uh, earlier this morning Susan Rice, uh, President Obama's national security advisor, took to Twitter saying, here's what President Trump should do. He should stay silent, keep quiet. Don't say anything. Basically, stay out of the way. Is that a wise strategy? No, I don't think I don't think it is. And I think you know what's great about this, and we're very hopeful in, in 2018, is that the president is demonstrating on the national state, on the international stage, how he won the presidency here at home. He's not only speaking pragmatically, but he's speaking what everyone knows to be true. Even President Obama knew it to be true and didn't say it. Regime after regime in Iran has suppressed freedom, has suppressed their freedom, and. It, it, and now the people are starting to rise up against that. It, it's not as big as what was earlier reported as 2009. But unlike President Obama, who cut a deal with the regime of Iran, President Trump is openly signaling to the people that we as a country are with them and should support them in their quest for freedom. David, what about that? What about Susan Rice now saying uh, President Trump should stay quiet when I remember Senator John McCain saying after what happened in 2009 that President Obama missed a golden opportunity, that some of the protesters were actually chanting Obama, Obama, as if they were craving U.S. leadership. Uh, why should the Obama people now say President Trump should keep his mouth shut? Well, let's put it in perspective. The last three administrations have failed to manage successfully Iran and North Korea, which we'll talk about later, the two deadliest places on the planet, the most difficult in terms of U.S. foreign policy, the stakes the highest. You know, I think that the president and the administration has to do a lot of things. Uh, they have to not just play the front channel, they have to play the back channel. I agree with President Trump that it's hard to defend the $33 billion of aid that we've given to Pakistan over the last couple of years, mm -hmm. which relates to Iran. And, and by the way, not to mention the $5 trillion we spent on wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Mm -hmm. Imagine if we spent that money at home or if we had other countries to spend it on other than uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. So I think he, I, my worry about, uh, I support the, the, the rising up. We're still learning about what's happening in Iran. It looks like it's a little more pragmatic than ideological. And, it, and I worry that there's not a leader there. I support um, encouraging that. The question is, do we do that on the front channel or the back channel. Uh, Vincent, what do you think about that? Lindsey Graham, Republican senator, said yesterday on CBS, tweets are fine, speak out, Mr. President, but we need a plan as well. What would you suggest the president needs to do to follow up on these tweets? Well, listen, absolutely, I agree with David. I mean, there should be a back channel that's explored, but who's going to be our back channel? Across all European capitals right now, you could hear a pin drop. Mm -hmm. So far, only Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Trump have been out front uh, supporting the people of Iran. We need the world community, especially the EU, to come out and help us uh, in this effort and help the people of, of Iran. This, this is another opportunity and it shouldn't be squandered. And, and David, on that point, why in the world did President Obama basically give the Iranian regime $150 billion to prop up the nuclear deal when, as President Trump is saying and people around the world are agreeing with him, the money is not getting to the people? It's a good question. I uh, was not in favor of the Iranian deal. I find it hard to defend. But the one thing I would say is, uh, for all of us who have doubts about that deal, what is, what is the contrarian approach? You know, you can't ignore Iran, and you can't, I don't believe, successfully military strike and take out their nuclear weapons. So what are your options? The one good thing about the Iranian deal, which is still in play, is that it is buying us some time. And we've got to take advantage of that in a lot of ways, not just militarily, but diplomatically. Vincent, uh, David makes some fair points, and when he talks about no good options, it sounds to me a lot like North Korea as we shift gears here. Uh, you have Kim Jong-un giving his uh, annual New Year's Day message saying maybe there's an overture to South Korea over the Olympics, but oh, by the way, I've got a phone on my desk that can launch a nuclear strike against the U.S. Where are we in this? Well, you know, I think today uh, Kim Jong-un saying that is, is, is laughable, but tomorrow it can be very, very real. and. Um, 
I, you know, I, I think that his overture to, to South Korea is not necessarily trying to draw a wedge between the United States and South Korea, but I think he sees a president. Uh, President Trump, who is acting un unconventionally. You know, conventional diplomacy has brought us to this point, and now we have a president who's willing to do things a bit unconventionally and talk openly about meeting with Kim Jong un or talking with, openly talking with uh, the North Koreans, mm -hmm. but also keeping the military options on the table. And last week, and with serious discussions about naval blockades, um, I think Kim Jong un uh, is buying time, but also seeing some writing on the wall. Uh, Vincent and David, we're going to dig deeper on North Korea with both of you later this hour. For now, David, uh, I want to ask you one last question about Iran, uh, which is uh, how you sort of see this playing out in the, the next couple of weeks. And in particular, uh, President Trump uh, promised in the campaign that he was going to decertify the Iran nuclear deal that we talked about, but so far has gone slow on that as commander in chief as he weighs his options. Yeah, and I think that's been wise, and I think I trust Secretary Mathis wisdom on this and a lot of the military folks around the president who I think are really doing a very patriotic and very good job. I think we've got to relook at our approach to Iran. Just like we're talking about Pakistan and the amount of money we've spent on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, we need to reboot our diplomatic strategy. We've got to be more strategic, more proactive, less mm -hmm. reactive, and work the back channel. Uh, a lot of global hotspots. As I said, we're going to bring you both back later this hour. We'll talk a little North Korea, a little Pakistan. Thanks for joining us now. We're going to dig deeper later this hour. Thank you. Great. Molly. A lot to unpack there. Uh, they could be the final murders of 2017. A gunman executing four people just before midnight on New Year's Eve. Investigators say the killer was related to most of the victims. And another family trage tragedy, 10 Americans killed when their plane falls from the sky. New details on the investigation coming up. <laughs> Tragic news over the holiday, a teenager in New Jersey accused of killing his own relatives in their home just moments before midnight on New Year's Eve. The county prosecutor says the 16-year-old shot his father, mother, sister, and a family friend. It happened in Long Branch, New Jersey, about 25, 25 miles south of New York City. The prosecutor says the teen's brother and grandfather escaped the house without getting hurt, and police arrested the suspect. Investigators say the family legally owned the gun that he used, no word yet, on a motive. Meanwhile, officials say the man who opened fire on five sheriff's deputies in Colorado, killing one of them, was an Iraq War veteran. They identified that gunman as this man, Matthew Real. Investigators say he fired more than 100 rounds at officers yesterday while he was holed up in his apartment. He died in the shootout. Investigators say he had ranted online about the sheriff and a local police officer. Investigators say that they're trying to figure out why a charter plane crashed, killing 10 Americans. Officials have not released the names of all of the people on board, but a family outside New York City says five of their relatives died in the crash. It happened yesterday in Costa Rica. Two local crew members also killed. An aviation official there says the plane went down soon after taking off from a northwestern city heading to the capital, San Jose. Laura Ingle is live with more. Uh, Laura, we are already learning more about this family who died in the crash, right? We are, Molly, and in fact, we are learning more about another family. This has just happened in the last few moments. We've been able to verify this, but let's start with the family we've been talking about most of the day. One family of five from New York and then a family of four from Florida were among the victims. Bruce and Irene Steinberg of Scarsdale, New York, told friends they were looking forward to taking their sons, William, Zachary, and Matthew, on an adventure through Costa Rica. The family was also known for being very involved in philanthropy and the local Jewish community. The Steinbergs were on the last stop of their trip yesterday and were headed to Costa Rica's capital when this crash occurred. And as I mentioned, we just learned the identities of four more Americans of a family from Florida, Leslie and Mitchell Weiss, and their two children, Hannah and Ari. The U.S. State Department issuing a statement to Fox confirming that multiple U.S. citizens died in the crash. We still have one more to identify, but they are not sharing that additional information at this time out of respect to the families. The investigation into the cause of the crash continues today. Investigators on the scene, Molly.
Yeah, what are we learning about the company and its safety record? Yeah, we've been looking into the records of Nature Air. This is the private airline which operates these charter flights around Costa Rica. And it turns out this is the second fatal incident in the last few months for this company. Twelve people lost their lives when the Cessna uh, 2000, 208B Grand Caravan aircraft were on exploded in flames after crashing into a wooded area just after takeoff yesterday. An eyewitness on the ground told one news agency she saw the plane take a nosedive after making a hard left turn. And then in September of 2017, an American and another passenger died on a Nature Air flight. The plane crashed minutes after taking off as well. Reports of strong winds in the morning on yesterday's crash that forced a change in the itinerary. Aviation officials had this to say. The plane from the accident had recently been authorized about a month ago, so it was within the certification to operate as an airliner. For a plane, in this case the doomed plane, to be duly registered, it goes through an inspection for airworthiness and functionality that permits operations such as those it was carrying out up until today. And we've also learned the pilot who was said to be experienced in yesterday's crash was the cousin of the ex-president of Costa Rica. Much more to learn on this developing situation. Back All to right, you. Lori, that is a very sad story. Thanks yeah. for staying on top of it. Thank you. Meanwhile, a top Republican ripping into the Justice Department for not releasing documents in the Russia probe. Our next guest says the DOJ may have a good reason, but it's also raising this question. What is the Justice Department trying to hide? He'll explain why forcing the DOJ to comply with a subpoena from Congress could be easier said than done. That's ahead. The Republican chairman of the House Intel panel slamming the Justice Department over the Russia investigation. California Congressman Devin Nunes accusing the agency of ignoring his committee subpoenas for documents relating to the so-called Trump dossier, an unverified collection of opposition research linking President Trump to Russia, or at least trying to. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge, live in Washington. Catherine, how are you? Good, Ed, and thank you. Of course, this week, the Justice Department and FBI are under new pressure to meet a Wednesday deadline to comply with a request for records and witnesses from the House Intelligence Committee. In this two-page letter, the committee's Republican chairman, Devin Nunez, writes that his investigators have been waiting for months, and the congressman pointed to the anti-Trump text messages sent by FBI agent Peter Strzok to an FBI lawyer with whom he was having an extramarital affair. The circumstances surrounding Strzok's removal from the investigation were leaked to the media rather than briefed to Congress. And Nunez writes, unfortunately, DOJ and FBI's intransigence with respect to the August 24 subpoenas is part of a broader pattern of behavior that can no longer be tolerated. And in a recent interview with Fox, the congressman went even further, saying the watchman should be investigated in this case, Ed. And we are learning more, at least we did over the weekend, about the Russia investigation's timeline. What do we know about that today? Well, the New York Times is reporting that in May 2016, Trump campaign aide George Papadopoulos told Australia's top diplomat in Britain, Alexander Downer, that the Russians had damaging information on then-candidate Hillary Clinton. And about two months after the meeting, WikiLeaks posted hacked DNC emails and Australian officials, according to the Times, passed information about Papadopoulos, who's there on the right, and his claims to U.S. intelligence. But based on our reporting here at Fox News, the timeline may be more nuanced. A month earlier, in April 2016, Fox News first reported on the Obama administration's extradition of a Romanian hacker known as Guccifer, and he was sent to Alexandria, Virginia. The 46-year-old hacker compromised the email account of Clinton confidant Sidney Blumenthal in 2013, and it was through that hack that Clinton's use of an unsecured personal server first came to light. The Times reports that the Papadopoulos meeting was another piece of intelligence separate from the Trump dossier that led the FBI to open the Russia probe. But it's important to emphasize that in the late spring of 2016, it was already well known to the FBI and Justice Department that the hacker Guccifer was using proxy servers in Russia to hide his activities, and this increased the likelihood that the documents were also held by the Russian said. Thank you, Catherine. Catherine Harrods You're Washington. welcome. All right, there's a lot to unpack here. Let's bring in Troy Slayton, a criminal defense lawyer and former prosecutor who specializes in constitutional law. Troy, Happy New Year. Thank you for being here to talk about this uh, subject, this unfolding matter that just seems to keep going. Uh, happy let, New Year, Molly. Yeah, let's kick off with what uh, um, 
is, the congressman uh, Devin Nunes is trying to accomplish. He's, there's this wed Wednesday deadline looming, and what he wants is information from the Department of Justice, from the FBI. He wants to get to the bottom of the whole dossier subject, uh, what it was used for, when it came into the hands of the FBI. Will he get the answers he's seeking, and will he see them by any chance sometime this week? Well, he might or he might not. <laughs> and Congress has the not only the absolute power, but the duty to conduct oversight over the FBI and the Department of Justice. And so if the FBI and the DOJ aren't willing to voluntarily turn over uh, documents and other materials related to anything that Congress wants to find out about, then they issue subpoenas. But the problem comes with the enforcement of a subpoena. There may be very good reasons to not comply with the subpoena, that there's classified information, that it affects national security, that there's an ongoing criminal investigation like we know there is here. But you just can't not respond. But the problem is, if they just don't respond and Congress wants to enforce the subpoena, they'd have to go to the DOJ. And certainly DOJ lawyers aren't going to go to court to seek a, uh, to seek a remedy or contempt against themselves. Yeah. What, what about that? A possible contempt of, of Congress? There's, as you mentioned, this is a big complicated web. Could we see some sort of action taken uh, if they don't see what they want to see by midweek, by the 3rd? Well, that would be the remedy normally under the, the normal course for uh, Congress then to ask the Justice Department to file contempt proceedings in federal court. But here, it's the Justice Department itself that is not complying. And if the reason why they're not complying is a question about national security or classified uh, documents, there are ways to handle that, especially with the Intelligence Committee. They have uh, secret rooms that uh, they're able to share information with the Congress uh, men and women uh, without having the worry that that information will be largely disseminated. All right, now let's shift to this uh, New York Times report that this former aide to the Trump campaign, George Papadopoulos, may have had this drunken conversation back in May of 2016, speaking with an Australian diplomat, uh, that he knew the Russians had some dirt on Hillary Clinton, uh, and then ultimately that diplomat passing information on to the U.S. intelligence. The idea behind this report is that, hey, maybe it wasn't the dossier, it wasn't the dossier, this came first, this conversation came first, but you know, does it doesn't matter exactly how the FBI got this investigation started. The, the political sides seem to really want each uh, estimate to matter, but does it ultimately matter from a legal circumstance? Well, uh, it, it, it may, because if the, if the sole impetus to start this investigation was this uh, largely discredited uh, steel dossier that looks like it was funded by the mm -hmm. uh, Clinton campaign, by the DNC, then that provides a problem. Then it looks like it was the DNC that paid to have uh, an investigation of the, the Trump campaign. Mm -hmm. But if there are other more innocuous reasons why the investigation was started that, that provided the probable cause for the FBI to seek the FISA warrants that may have provided uh, legal grounds for surveillance on Trump aides, then that is a, a really big deal. Yeah, so, so then the repercussions in, in essence. But at the same time, it wouldn't change the, the actions that were taken regarding the dossier. If the DNC and the Clinton campaign still paid for everything that went down and created, that ultimately led to creation of this dossier, it doesn't change you know, the actions that were taken by those people, those entities, those individuals, right? Absolutely, and you, you can't unring the bell. Right. Uh, the investigation is started. So whatever reason the investigation is started, we're, we're far down that path. A, a special counsel has been appointed. Uh, Mueller is conducting the investigation. And although there are uh, arguments and good arguments uh, coming from the Republicans about the independence of the, of the special counsel and some um, possible uh, appearance of Propriety that may be involved with some of the uh, prosecutors and investigators on Mueller's team, uh, the investigation is underway and is going to go forward. Yeah, there's a lot of digging to be done still. You know that question, the chicken or the egg, which came first? I'm sure the answers will come out on that. Hopefully in the end, we'll get a lot of these answers. Troy Slayton, we appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Molly.
Meanwhile, Kim Jong-un claims he has a button on his desk that would let him nuke any spot in the U.S. Serious stuff. Yeah, that was just part of the North Korean dictator's annual New Year's message. But he also says he wants to talk with South Korea about the Winter Olympics next month. Could that mean that he is down to make a deal? It is the top story, bottom of the hour, on this first day of 2018. From America's News Headquarters, we are Fox News. Kim Jong-un says the nuclear button is on his table and he could hit the U.S. with a missile at any moment. The North Korean dictator spoke in his annual New Year's address. Kim also said North Korea's nuclear arsenal is now a, quote, reality, and he claims the entire U.S. mainland is in range. It comes after the country ramped up missile launches and tested a nuclear weapon last year. Rich Ed Edson has been so diligent on this subject for us all throughout the day. Rich, what's the latest? Well, Molly, the message from Kim Jong-un is that North Korea can hit the United States with nuclear weapons and that North Korea seeks peace in the region. In his annual New Year's address, Kim Jong-un said, quote, when it comes to North-South relations, we should lower the military tensions on the Korean Peninsula to create a peaceful environment. Both the North and the South should make efforts. He even suggested discussions with South Korea on the possibility of North Korea sending athletes to participate in next month's Winter Olympics in South Korea. The Trump administration's policy, isolate North Korea, convince it to halt its missile and nuclear tests. The U.S. has pressured nations to cut their economic ties with Kim Jong-un. The U.S. also says it will negotiate with North Korea only when it earns its way back to discussions by changing its behavior. South Korea says it will speak with North Korea, and analysts say Kim's talk of peace is an attempt to separate South Korea from its ally, the United States. Meanwhile, the UN Security Council continues sanctioning North Korea. China has supported those measures, though blocked stronger ones. The US says China has helped on North Korea, though says it needs to do more. China and Russia say they want the United States to suspend joint military exercises with South Korea. The US says it refuses to halt defensive maneuvers in exchange for North Korea stopping its already illegal activity. Molly. And the U.S. is holding back aid to Pakistan. Yeah, an official with the administration's National Security Council says the U.S. does not plan to spend the $255 million budgeted in military aid for Pakistan. The official says the U.S. expects Pakistan to take decisive action against terrorists and militants within its borders, and that will determine whether the administration will restore funding. President Trump tweeted this morning that Pakistan has taken U.S. assistance and returned nothing but lies and deceit thinking of our leaders as fools. In response, Pakistan's foreign minister tweeted, quote, we will respond to President Trump's tweets shortly, inshallah. We'll let the world know the truth, difference between facts and fiction. Last year, the Trump administration announced its strategy for South Asia. It called on Pakistan to address terrorists hiding there. Pakistan has long maintained its forces have cleared terrorists from within its borders, though the U.S. says Pakistan mostly focused on terrorists that attacked its government. And extremists continue to hide in Pakistan and launch attacks on coalition forces in Afghanistan. Molly. Rich, you have covered an incredible amount of ground for us today. Thank you so much. From Washington, Thanks, Rich Edson. All around the world, in fact. So let's bring back our political panel, Republican strategist Vincent Velasio, former campaign manager for George Pataki's presidential run, and Democratic strategist David Morey. He's a co-author of The Leadership Campaign. David, I want to start with you. I think you uh, mentioned Pakistan earlier in our conversation. Uh, and uh, while you're a Democrat, it seems to me that you were fair in saying uh, that uh, President Trump may have a point here. Democratic and Republican presidents alike have been pouring money into Pakistan uh, with the hope, the prayer, that maybe they would help us in the war on terror, but they clearly have not done enough. No, it's time to reboot the strategy. Even President Obama had his doubts and about the Pakistani leadership. Who wouldn't, looking at the situation, although I would note when he took Osama bin Laden out, nobody notified that government in mm -hmm. advance. We've had a complicated relationship. I don't see what's wrong with the reboot. Uh, but Pakistan is important in the region, so we need to do that very strategically. You know, Vincent, I wonder, uh, you know, a lot of people, even some Republicans, not just Democrats, mocked President Trump as a candidate for some of these positions of sort of shaking up years, decades of American foreign policy. But when it comes to Pakistan, 
some fresh thinking, whether this is the right approach or not, some fresh thinking might be needed. A absolutely. And I think, you know, hopefully again in 2018 we'll see the foreign policy of, of Donald Trump materialize. You know, Ed, you've covered politics for, for a very long time. We've heard the slogans, country first, America first, and I think we're tr finally seeing that materialize under President Trump. We've had $33 billion go to Pakistan over the last 15, billion, uh, the last 15 years. My hard-earned tax dollars and yours. And what was the return on our investment? We have a duplicitous partner in that region, and like David said, they weren't even notified when they found Osama bin Laden there. And mm -hmm. where was he? He was there, and now he they refused. He was in Pakistan, and they refused to turn over another terrorist captor uh, earlier this year. So we're not dealing w with an honest broker, and it's time that that you know America starts getting our, our return on investment and use the carrot and stick appropriately. Mm -hmm. David, I promised to get to you on North Korea a little earlier in our conversation. Uh, and I wonder, uh, some months back, when President Trump talked about fire and fury again, all of these fancy foreign policy, policy people grabbed their chins and stroked it and said, hmm, that might have been tough rhetoric. Uh, but in fact, now, over the holidays, we see that China is still shipping oil into North Korea, despite all of these wise people in both parties saying, oh, China's so important, they're going to come around, they're going to help us diplomatically. What are the president's options moving forward? Well, and as you said, the, there's mixed messages from Kim Jong-un's New Year's speech. On the one hand, he talked about reaching out to South Korea via the Winter Olympics in that country in February. On the other hand, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mike Mullen, mm -hmm. not known for hyperbole, said we're closer to nuclear war than ever before. Listen, I think we've got to reboot that relationship, and I think the Trump administration has begun to do that. Secretary Tillerson gave a very good speech at the Atlantic Council. We do have to ramp up diplomacy. We've got to do a lot of things simultaneously. Let me make one key point. Three administrations have failed, just like with respect to Iran, mm -hmm. and there's no good option when it comes to, South, uh, to North Korea. You can't ignore them, starve them, destroy them, or even negotiate with them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, destroying them would involve, some people think, a trillion dollars and a million lives within the first days of a conflagration on the peninsula. So there's no good option. What we have to do, I think, is get really smart, get really Realistic. It's unrealistic the sanctions alone will solve the problem. It's also unrealistic to get North Korea to completely give up its nuclear weapons, given the, the rationality of that administration. I put rationality in quotes. Mm -hmm. So I think we've got to take steps to freeze the nuclear weaponry, uh, de-escalate tensions, create a moratorium, and eventually, if they did all that, there would be room for a treaty between South Korea and North Korea and the United States. So that's what they really want. That's the one carrot down the line that could be interesting. Mm -hmm. And Vincent, just as we see in Iran, these protests, because uh, in part, the people feel like the mullahs are, are not sharing the wealth. Uh, in North Korea, certainly, uh, Kim Jong-un starving his own people. We've heard about this uh, right. for years. You're not going to see protests in North Korea because he'll uh, likely no. kill, the, kill protesters right. and, and suppress it uh, even stronger than we've seen in Iran. Uh, but, but what do you see, with one minute to go here, what do you see as the president's best options in 2018 in terms of North Korea? Well, I agree with David. There are really no good options. Uh, I, I would, I'm very interested to exploring the, the blockade option to increase pressure a, 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 as it relates to the sanctions, because right now the sanctions aren't working, and in order to put increased pressure or, or maybe fortify the sanctions, I think the blockade may be necessary, but there really are no good options as it comes to North Korea. From Iran to Pakistan, as well as North Korea, not a lot of good options for this president, a lot on his plate heading into 2018. Thanks for taking a serious look at it uh, for all of us and, and, and our viewers, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year. Transgender people can join the U.S. military starting today. Justice Department officials said last week they would drop the legal battle over the proposed ban, at least for now. President Trump tweeted in July, you may remember, that he would not allow transgender people to enlist. But so far, the courts have not sided with the White House on this issue. National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin, live at the Pentagon with the latest on this. Jennifer. Molly, today transgender individuals can join the U.S. military if certain conditions are met and a doctor certifies that the individual has completed medical transition and have been stable for 18 months. The U.S. military was forced to comply with a federal court mandate last month that goes into effect today. Staff Sergeant Katie Schmid filed one of the four lawsuits currently pending against the federal government after President Trump tried to ban transgenders from serving. While I was recognized for my excellence at work prior to coming out, um, having to hide who I was prevented me from having full confidence as a leader and forging strong relationships with others in my unit. 
The White House has tried to reverse an Obama-era decision to allow transgender troops to serve openly in the military. Then Defense Secretary Ash Carter made the announcement in June 2016. The Defense Department and the military need to avail ourselves of all talent possible in order to remain what we are now, the finest fighting force the world has ever known. Last summer, President Trump weighed in on the issue in a series of tweets surprising the Pentagon. Now several judges have blocked the president's order. After consultation with my generals and military experts, please be advised that the United States government will not accept or allow transgender individuals to serve in any capacity in the U.S. military. Our military must be focused and decisive and overwhelming victory and cannot be burdened with the tremendous medical costs and disruption that transgender in the military would entail. Thank you. Today's decision does not change the status of those transgender troops already serving. There are other cases pertaining to them that are winding their way through the courts, Molly. Yeah, and those legal battles are not over yet, right? That's right. These other lawsuits could go all the way to the Supreme Court at some point. In the meantime, the Justice Department decided not to appeal a recent court-ordered stay, and Defense Secretary Mattis has ordered a group of experts to review the impact of transgender troops on unit cohesion, a review being led by an Obama-era appointee. Mattis will report to the president on its findings in February, and the president must make a decision by March 23rd about how to proceed. Bottom line, Today, if a transgender person has a medical professional certify that the individual has been stable for 18 months and has completed all medical treatment associated with gender reassignment, then that person can enlist in the U.S. military for now. Molly? All right, Jennifer, thank you. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. And if you've ever wanted to be your own boss, now may be the perfect time. The new tax law could mean big bucks for independent contractors. We'll talk it over with an accountant next. And Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts calling for an evaluation of how the judicial branch handles allegations of sexual harassment, saying the courts are not immune to those problems in the workplace we've seen in other sectors. After California federal court judge Alex Kaczynski abruptly retired following a Washington Post story detailing several accusations of sexual misconduct. Now you might be able to save a load of money this year on your taxes if you become a contractor. That's because under the GOP's tax plan, folks can deduct 20% of their taxable income if they're independent contractors instead of company employees. But that, of course, could also mean that you lose your company's benefits like health insurance. Let's bring in Daniel Geltrude. He is a certified public accountant and a business and finance analyst. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Molly. So I want to kick things off. Does the way that tag, this new tax code, the reform, the way it's written, does it incentivize people to essentially leave their employers and strike out on their own and exactly how would it work? Absolutely it does. So the pass-through entities, like being a sole proprietor or being a partnership or an S-corp, allows you to pass through your income. But the new tax law has created the a deduction of 20% of your income. It's a free deduction. So right there is the incentive for people to go from being an employee to being an independent contractor using a pass-through entity type. Mm -hmm. Now, 20%, that is, that's a big deduction. So I'm sure a lot of people are like, well, heck, maybe I'll think about that. That could save me up $10,000, $15,000 when they do the math in the end. But at the same time, striking out on your own can be pretty expensive, especially when it comes to health care. If you've got to pay for that on the side instead of getting it through your employer, right? So there are things to think about. Yes, there's certainly an offset here because if you're no longer an employee, then you're no longer going to get those employee benefits like medical, like overtime, like uh, sharing in profit sharing plans if your employer offers that or how about this if you lose your job if you're an independent contractor you can't collect unemployment so there's definitely an offset to that 20 percent benefit and you really have to sit back and think about is it the right move who would it be the right move for like who should think about this who will it really benefit 
Well, the IRS has very specific rules about this. So it's not just, oh, I want to become an independent contractor or a company deciding we're not going to have employees anymore. We're just going to have independent contractors. So it really comes down to what's called control, the control rule. That's what the IRS uses as a guideline. If the employer controls the employee, whether they're classified as an employee or an independent contractor, you're supposed to be an employee. That's now, it. And, and how does this infect, affect employers, potentially? Well, it's a windfall for employers because, generally speaking, when you have independent contractors working for you instead of employees because of the things we just talked about, the employer saves all those costs, which means they can be a lot more competitive in their pricing and more profitable at the same time. So this is a windfall and an incentive for an employer to try this. But then again, the IRS, this is not something that they want to see happen and they're going to look to enforce this a lot more stringently than they have in the past. What about uh, just society as a whole? If we see more people being independent contractors, uh, that means fewer people are on, you know, getting the traditional benefits that they would see at a big corporation. Uh, is it good? Is it bad? I mean, is it, is it simply a matter of freedom and choice? It's really a shift. If you're an employee and there's certain advantages and disadvantages to being an employee, that's what that is. And if you're an independent contractor, you have the same offsets. I don't particularly think that this is going to have a huge impact, per se, on society. I don't think everyone is just going to automatically run out and say to their employer, hey, listen, I want to be an independent contractor from now on. I think it will happen, but again, I must warn those people, if they're going to do it, that the IRS has specific rules and they're gonna be looking for people to do this so that's that was gonna be my final question what would your advice be for people that are listening to this segment listening to you talk and going man 20% that sounds pretty good